why is that four footer for 79 so hard if you've never broken 80 before? Because you're thinking about the fact that it could be a 79. So where are you? You're in the future. If you're in the future, you're not in a performance state. I'll make it this simple. If you want to perform, stay in the present. If you're worried about the future, you're not going to perform. Golf Smarter, number 803, is brought to you by dynamicgolfers.com slash golf smarter. Are you a second swing All-American? How to hit that second great tee shot first with Josh Zander. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Josh. Great to be with you, Fred, as always. Thank you so much for helping in the celebration and for us celebrating you. <laughs> well, congratulations. That's pretty impressive. So you must have some people who, uh, who like to listen to what uh, you have to offer, which is, uh, which is great. It's awesome. I hope so. I hope so. I just like to ask a lot of questions. So I think that's, <laughs> that's why I keep doing it. Being curious is a great trait. Keep it going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, You've got some great stuff going on the Xander Golf app right now. Uh, the videos are really good. I want to I want to dig into a couple of them. Okay, great. Uh, but before we do that, I, I there's a couple of things on on your website that kind of jumped out at me that I don't know that I've recognized for you before. Uh, what is it? Says your Body Track cer- certified B O D I T R A K. What is Body Track? Body tracks a technology that helps you understand how you're uh, fresh, how you're using the ground to, to shift pressure. And the way we use the ground, if you think about the golf swing, we're, we're attached to the ground through our feet and to the golf club through our hands. So, so those are two pretty important body parts to understand. And body track does a nice job of helping people understand how they shift pressure throughout the motion. And it's interesting is the signatures of, um, what we call the COP traces or the center pressure traces, the line that, that uh, your pressure makes throughout the swing, it's different for, for just about everybody. Um, so there's no one way to do it. As, as we know, the golf swings are, are everybody's kind of got their own custom golf swing. And some can be highly functional with very different um, center pressure traces. And uh, body track allows you to find which one works for you. And what's, what's really interesting with understanding what's going on with the ground reaction forces, how you interact with the ground has a lot to do with how the club, how the club moves in space. So a few years ago, when uh, Michelle Wee was at Stanford, she was out on the range, and David Ledbetter walked up to give her a lesson. And I went and chatted with him, and I said, "What are you guys working on?" I expected him to talk about, you know, club club shaft positions and things like that. And and he goes, "You know, it's all about this was this is when Michelle Wee was in school, so that's got to be over a decade ago now, I think." Uh, Easily, yeah. It's been a while. Um, and he was saying, you know, everything is really happening with how we're interacting with the ground. So so we're really working on how she, uh, on her footwork was basically his answer. And then I just left them alone to do, the, to do their lesson. But, um, but yeah, so, so Body Track does that. Um, there's there are pressure plates out there. Um, there's all kinds of technology now that really helps you understand how you use the ground. Um, and, and, uh, I can keep going into this. Um, I, I find it fascinating. So there's basically three ways we use the ground as far as, as far as, uh, um, power is concerned. One is side to side. So you can think of that as like swaying back and swaying through to a certain extent or shifting pressure from one leg to the other leg. That's one source of power. There's the torquing force, which is the, the you know, we, we think of it as a pivot or a turn, how we torque the ground. That is another source of power. And then we have the the vertical forces, which you know we like to call launching off the ground. If you look at like Lexi Thompson or Justin Thomas, you see they're almost airborne at impact. Bubba Watson's another one. So, you know, there's this whole discussion about maintaining your posture or early extension. You hear a lot about in the golf swing where people are trying to stay in posture, and frankly, um, a lot of people are missing out on some vertical forces when they do that. So there's no fundamental that says you must stay in posture to hit a good golf shot. If, uh, if that was the case, then, uh, then Justin Thomas would have to give all his money back because he had a good <laughs> posture. 
and he's done quite well um, with with how he's launched off the ground and used vertical force. In fact, he actually the the data shows that he puts more than twice his body weight into the ground in transition, and that's why he's exploding up. So just think about when you jump, you got to push into the ground, and then the ground pushes you back up into the air. And basically, when he presses down on the ground in transition, that that amount of pressure he's putting down pushes him back up off the ground and he explodes up and that's why he's literally airborne. And if you watch the long drive guys, you'll see a lot of those guys, their feet, you know, come off the ground, especially their lead foot because that's what they're pushing off of. And the lead foot works as not only kind of a, a launching pad, but also a braking pad. So if in order for something to go by fast, something has to stop. So you think of it like, like uh, if you're watching one of those uh, car crash dummies, you know, go right through the windshield when the car hits the hits the wall. That's because there's been a transfer of energy there, right? So, the other day I was at the Giants game. I'm a huge San Francisco Giants fan, by the way. At the moment of this recording, we're in first place, um, and we got some. And what great- a great series over the weekend! That yeah. was a fabulous series <laughs> with so, the A's. I think it was a week and a half ago. I was at the game, and Brandon Crawford is just tearing the cover off the ball, and I had a great angle, so I got a. I got my iPhone out and I'm I'm zooming in on him making his swings and he hits this ball into McCovey Cove and it was a foul ball, but I didn't care. I just wanted to see a swing and he just nailed it. And what was really cool was watching how his lead leg, he's lefty, so his right leg actually pushed back away from the pitcher to allow his bat to come through the zone really fast. So his right leg was acting as a braking B R E A or excuse me, B R A K E braking mechanism to allow the the bat to to sling through the zone and just absolutely wail on the ball. And that's what we do in the in golf as well. So we've you know talked about this like hitting into a firm lead side. Well actually if you push back away from the target as you're coming through, you'll get even more power. So Shifting pressure, understanding when to shift it, how to shift it, um, is is really important for power. And it also is important for club position. So instead of kind of trying to manipulate a club into position, if you understand how to use the ground, how you twist the ground, how you push off the ground, how you shift from side to side, you can make some pretty big changes in how you move the club, along with getting a lot of power, too. Obviously... You know, when people come to me for lessons, they're looking for a couple of things in their full swing. They're looking for more power and they're looking for better striking. And so understanding, if you don't understand the pressure piece and the ground reaction force piece, you're missing some pretty big, big information as far as helping your player. Um, okay. I, uh, too many questions. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Too many questions for that, but my first one was: Did you go on Father's Day to the Giants game <laughs> um, against the no, Phillies? We, uh, no, we went to um, which game did we go to? Was the game just before that Saturday? I was at that game. <laughs> it was yeah. two. That's two that's that was two different lost. ball games. Yeah, right. Yeah. It was two different ball games. It was like a double header because. The first six innings, which it was six to six after the six yeah. innings, and that took two and a half to three hours, and Crazy. then it was six not seven nothing after that. Right. So okay, yeah. enough about the, <laughs> we were at the same game. We were probably yeah. sitting one second apart. All right. So recently, <laughs> um, uh, I'll ask the question after that. Let's take a time out. I'll be right back. This episode of Golf Smarter is brought to you by DynamicGolfers.com. As we've discussed so many times on Golf Smarter, when our game deteriorates, we refuse to admit that we're aging. We blame the clubs, the balls, even our playing partners, when in fact, we need to realize that unfortunately, muscles do not naturally maintain their healthy or ideal range of motion that we had when we were younger. And when I say younger, I mean as kids. If you're anywhere between the age of 25 and Take your pick, your muscles change their functional resting length to adapt to the length at which they are habitually used or positioned. As a culture, we are spending more and more time sitting, which results in weak hamstrings, tight hip flexors, and a pelvic tilt. 
To add to this, playing golf puts your muscles under stress, demanding a range of motion that may not be possible with shortened and weakened muscles. Not only will shortened muscles impact your flexibility, club head speed, and enjoyment of the game, but they will eventually lead to injury. Again, this is why I highly encourage you to sign up for DynamicGolfers.com. Dynamic Golfers programs are meant to serve as a solution to common nagging pain points that most golfers experience. Each program varies in length, but most are meant to be repeated over time. The routine combines both mobility and strength movements. The video workouts are only 15 to 20 minutes each and focus on easy-to-do dynamic stretches that are specifically designed to help you get into and stay in golfer shape. So if you want to play better golf, work on the most important tool in your bag, your body. For only $9.99 a month, most likely less than what you pay for in balls each month, join golfers worldwide that make dynamic golfers part of their daily routine. Go to dynamicgolfers.com slash golf smarter now to get a seven day free trial and 15% off your membership when you check out using the coupon code golf smarter. Again, that's dynamicgolfers.com slash golf smarter. Recently, I've been working, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this app called Perfect Motion. Um, and it's, it's really quite, a, it uses artificial intelligence to track your, your body motion and stuff. And I feel like it's helped me a lot because I always had an issue, um, with at the end of my swing, especially with the driver, my body was curved back. I was in a, like a, my body was in a C and, but away from the ball. And I was, you know, draw it fading and slicing the ball. And I think a lot that had a lot to do with it. And one of the things that I've learned from using this app on a regular basis is now having that coming through and and, uh, having the pressure on my lead foot, my left foot, I'm right handed. So having the pressure uh, on at at contact and through going forward. Yeah. And it's made a big difference. I'm getting more yardage. There's a couple things going on in my life right now that I think have contributed to my my greater distance, but I'm hitting the ball straighter. I'm not hitting the the slices as much as the big uh, as I still have a fade, but I'm yeah. not complaining about that. Yeah. So but that's makes- the kind of stuff that is that is new, so nuanced, you know, that it takes it's taken me years to understand that I ended up back that way and yeah. to correct that. Luckily, I have this app that's like been a teacher to help me it's through. It's great to get feedback like that because then you can start to match correct to a feel. Because when you're playing you can't you, you can't see yourself. So you have to you have to have some kind of kind of a feel that you can you can tap into. So it's great that you have that, that feedback. You just gotta be careful when you use when you use those those apps. You just gotta know what you're looking for. I think I think it's great. Right. I'm all for measuring um I, I love to measure because if you're measuring, not guessing, um, you hate to guess and be wrong. Um, so um, just understand what that data is telling you because it is different from player to player. And, and when you watch video, so you might end up in a reverse seat position, but were you there at impact? Was the pressure forward and impact? Like Justin Thomas talking about the center of pressure trace. As he starts coming down, he shifts that pressure into his left leg, and then just before impact, shifts it back to his right. There he is throwing on the brakes, right? So, like, wait a second. We take a picture of you at impact, and we say, oh, your pressure's on your wrong foot. It's on the right foot instead of left. And Well, but where was it in transition? You know, so you got you just got to be careful. It also depends on what shot you're hitting, right? If I'm trying to hit a high-flighted ball, I may want to be a little bit more on my on my trail leg. If I want to hit a low bullet underneath a tree or something, I may want to be more on my left side. I may not ever want to leave my left side. Like on a chip shot, I might just stay on my lead side the whole time and not really shift to my right. And whereas on a driver, I may want to start shifting forward into my lead side and then put on the brakes and go back and launch it up in the air and get my 13 or 14 degree launch angle, my three or four degree upward attack angle and get that thing you know, soaring and, and, and carrying as far as I can. Then I might get into the wind and say, hey, I'm going to 
I'm going to stay more on my lead side. I'm just going to hit a little bull, a bullet stinger underneath the wind here. So those pressure traces will look very different. The ground reaction forces will look very different. And just, it's like, it's like my friend Mike Adams says, the answer to every golf question is, it depends. <laughs> that helps. No wonder we've done over 800 episodes. <laughs> and there's 800 more to come. <laughs> At least. Oh, well... Well, we'll see about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, uh, so on this Perfect Motion app, and I, I'd love for you to check it out. Um, so uh, you can sign up to work with a teacher who, when you record on this app, it goes to the teacher and then he sends you feedback. And I'm working with Chip Beck. Oh, uh, I'm sure you remember. Yeah. Sure. So I had, Chip was on the show. He helped promote this and, and uh, made an amazing offer to the audience to to work with him on it. So I've been getting feedback from Chip and then what happens is he sends me an email and then I get some videos from him saying, here, check this out. This might help. So yeah. perfect motion. Awesome. It, but, but we'll talk about your app too, because there's a lot to go on there. And I want to start with, because you're talking about it, one of the more recent videos that you did was on foot pressure. So it gets kind of like where we are right now in this conversation. Yeah. Talk about that video. Well, I've done so many videos, and I don't know when I did that one, but um, recently, it's a new one. Recently. Yeah, um, I'm not. I, I'm not sure which one exactly. So, as far as talking okay, about, me, it, talk about foot let, let, well, you had your alignment stick in your belt loops. Okay. Yeah. You were out on the golf. You were out on the golf course. I don't know if it was Stanford. Okay. But that, was, that was a long time ago. Oh, but it's in, oh, it's in my library. It's in my library. It may have just been released recently, but yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, how you how you torque? I think it's the one about how you, how you turn how you torque the ground. Did I have a towel underneath my feet? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so if you think about how you make a backswing turn, how you pressure the ground when you're turning, just to make a pivot going back, you twist the ground. So if you had like a welcome mat underneath you, you'd be twisting it if you're a right-handed player, to your right. And then if you want to turn your hips coming through, you would twist it the other direction. Um, and if you wanted to be like Roy McIlroy and even have a little bit of a turn going back and then a little bit more turn as you start coming down and really torque the ground, you could actually pressure the ground that way and keep turning the welcome mat to the right as a right-handed player and the downswing. And that would make you stay more from the inside. The earlier you twist the ground, the, the more from the outside the club will come. And you can actually do that if you're trying to hit a fade. So how you interact with the ground as far as torquing, we're not talking about the side to side or launching yet, but how you're torquing or twisting the ground will affect how the club comes down in space for sure. More from the inside if you twist the ground to the right as a right-handed player in the transition, and more from the outside if you twist it to the left in transition. Very good. Okay, cool. Um, another topic I wanted to bring up with you today uh, is, <laughs> this is a silly one. So they, uh, something that happens regularly with my group um, is they hit, we hit a drive, we hit a shot, lose the ball out of bounds, second shot, make this amazing shot. We call that second swing All-American. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And recently I played with somebody who said, yeah, my friend told me he's going to write a book called How to Hit Your Second Shot First. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, can I steal that? Because I want to do a full episode on that. Yeah. Is that a mind thing? Is that where, what, at, why is that second shot usually so much better than the first? Usually, not always. And right. how do we prevent that first one from happening? Okay, so the first question I would ask is, what if there was the same amount of pressure on that second shot as there was on the first? Yeah. Because oftentimes your weekend golfer hits one out of bounds, it's like, oh, um, you know, fill an expletive here, you know, get up there and just rip it without thinking too much, right? And they're not in their own way because they're all like, oh, I'm already going to make a double or worse on the hole. I might even be in pocket and I can't take more than double or triple on this hole, so it's not a big deal. Now, put that same player in a tournament where after he hits it out of bounds, he's got to put the next one in play and tell me if that second shot's as good as when he's just kind of letting it go where he doesn't worry about it. 
And that's the, that's the thing. And there was a tournament done with one of the local courses around here where they actually had, you had the ability to take a second shot. But you also had to, if I'm not mistaken, you had to actually take it if you chose to hit a second shot. And all of a sudden, it wasn't so easy anymore, right? So the whole thing becomes, what's your mindset when you're hitting the ball? You have some kind of pressure on you, fine, right? There's pressure on everybody, whatever, whether you're playing a major championship or whether you're hitting your tee shot off the number one in front of a few people who are waiting to hit behind you, whatever it is. There's a bad $2 battle lane, whatever it is. You, you, you feel something, right? The question is, how do you handle it? Because pressure is going to come up. So that's where, you know, we talk about the mental side of the game and putting yourself in a, in a good mental space to hit the shot, right? And ultimately, if you're worried about the result, you're in the future. And being in the present is how, being in the present is how we perform. It goes back to the vision 54, staying in the present, being sensory, see the shot, feel the shot, hear the shot, whatever you need to get yourself into that shot. Acknowledge the pressure. Okay, I'm nervous. Take a deep breath. Cleanse it out. Get into what you're trying to do. Stay in the present. Staying in the present could be something as simple as picturing the shot. I'm going to imagine this shot like the pro tracer on TV fading from the left side of the fairway into the right center of the fairway. Or it could could be uh, uh, a, a balance thought. I'm going to feel like I'm going to swing in perfect balance when I hit this shot. So now you're in the present and you have access to your skills. We've done we've done shows on this where, where I've talked about how to access your skills, right? So the, the thing is, you gotta you gotta acknowledge. Here's a shot in front of you. Okay, there's pressure. Fine. Now let me get into what I need to do. Whether it's your first shot or your second shot. To answer your question, the best the best answer I can give you as far as why is a second shot better? It's because they don't care anymore. Right? They're just letting it go. So now they have access to however good a golfer they are because, hey, I'm out of the hole anyway. So I'm going to let it go. Why is that four footer for 79 so hard if you've never broken 80 before? Because you're thinking about the fact that it could be a 79. So where are you? You're in the future. If you're in the future, you're not in a performance state. I'll make it this simple. If you want to perform, stay in the present. If you're worried about the future, you're not going to perform. You don't have access to what you know how to do. And that's the major bummer for golfers is when they know they can do something. And I'm talking about realistic golfers. Somebody's, I know I can hit my seven iron 150 yards. Not the guy who says he can because he thinks it goes 150 yards. But hey, I've been on track, man. I hit 150 yards. How come on the golf course I tense up and hit it 135 and it flies into the front bunker? Right? It's a bummer you didn't have access to your skills. Well, stop worrying about the result. You have no control over that. Stay in the present. To you know, go through your process and let the result be what the result is. That's why we have a short game. If it doesn't work out, you you you, you learn how to chip. The best players in the world are hitting thirteen greens around. Okay, so they're not hitting. Yeah, but, right, but they're worrying about. They're thinking about the result. They have to. No, not when they're playing their best. That was a, it was, uh, I, the, the, uh, I think it was the memorial when John Rahm was having that amazing third round before all the thing, all that went down that we know about now. And I think it was, I can't remember which announcer it was, but said, I don't think he knows. And maybe it was Nicholas who was in the booth. He goes, he probably doesn't know what he's shooting right now. So there's the best golfer arguably on the planet ever saying, John Rahm probably has no idea how many under par he is. He's just, he's all about the shot in front of him. And then he goes out to 63 or something. Because that's what it is. And the thing is, I don't care if you're shooting 63, 83, or 103. If you want to be the best you can be, you've got to be in the present. You're going to be in the present, you, 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 you'll be able to perform. And it's as simple as that. You want access to, to your skill set, stay in the present. There's lots of material out there on how to do that. That's like a perfect 60 minutes. Boom, we got that final line. Let's take another time out. <laughs> okay, let's pick it up at the pressure on the putting green. Another thing I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I still, oh, uh, you know, it's the not inside the leather. It's outside the leather, so it's not a gimme because I'm not, we don't play, you know, every single putt because eh, it's good. You're good. Pick it up. 
But, you know, outside the leather, we're like, come on, guys, let's not do that. But if it's like even outside the putter, six, eight, it's still not a long putt. Yep. But I'm missing those way too often. Right. I missed I missed four of those the other day. And it's like, come on, Fred, you practice that all the time. All right. So I got I, I got one mental thought, and then I'm going to talk about a technical thought here. The mental yeah. thought is what we just talked about about being in the future. When you're about to hit it, call it a three foot putt just outside the length of your putt or some three or four foot putt. You pretty much know what you're going to make on the hole if you make it or if you miss, right? Mm, so let's say you're yeah. up for a par and a par four. You know, if you miss it, it's a bogey. If you make it, it's a par, right? The future is just right there in front of you saying, listen to me, it's the future. You, you're going to either make a par or you're going to make a bogey on this hole. Now, when you're at the first, when you're, when you're starting the hole, you kind of have no idea what you're going to make. You could, you could quadruple, but you have no clue. And so you've got a better chance of staying in the present because the future is not just going like, you know, unless you're playing in a tournament, you need to par the last hole or something to win the tournament or to do whatever you need to do in the tournament. But, but basically, it's, it's such a mental challenge because um, there was a guy named Stephen Yellen. I don't know if you've ever interviewed him. Wrote the book, The Fluid Motion Factor, where he talked about the DNA goal of a situation. For example, the DNA goal, if if uh, Steph Curry gets fouled with, with .01 on the clock and they're down by two and he gets two free throws, he knows, I've got to make them or we lose. There's no chance otherwise. So the DNA goal of the situation is make the two free throws. However, thinking about making them and the result is not going to let him be fluid, to put it in Stephen Yellen's terms, right? So he says the best athletes to stay fluid suppress the DNA goal. Well, so now you're, here you are with your four-footer again, right? And the DNA goal of the situation is make the four-footer, right? Okay, so here we are. We're not going to be fluid if we're thinking about the result. We don't have access to our skills. Because I think putting a four-footer might be the simplest motion in the history of sports if you think about what it takes to actually move a putter to hit a ball four feet. It's not like some triple twist off the high diving board, right? It's not that hard, right? It's really easy. In, in it, it's simple, maybe not easy, but simple, right? So here's what you have to tell yourself. Okay, here comes the, here comes the, uh, the, the thought, I want to make a par, I need to make this to win the bet, or I need to make this to stay even par, whatever it is, right? And you're okay, let that cycle through and now get on task. I'm going to be sensory here. I'm going to imagine the ball going in right along the break at nine o'clock on a clock. Or I'm going to bang it against the dirt on the back of the hole. Or the last revolution is going to go right over the front. Or when the ball lands in the hole, a frog's going to jump out because there was water and a frog in it. I don't care how ridiculous you have to make it. Make it childlike. Make it play-like so you're so into the present of the situation. And now you have access to your ability to make a four-foot putt, which is not that hard. Now, that's the mental side of it, right? Here's the physical side of it. What's the most important thing on a four foot putt? Is it distance or direction? Uh, it's got to be. So I'm always. This is always that question I ask people who are new to the game. It's it's like always. Uh, it's going to be distance. Well, distance is it, always going to be important. But on a four foot putt, the main thing is we got to have that ball straight. straight. Where you got to hit that ball straight now. If you can't roll a ball four feet or somewhere in the vicinity of four feet, you got to do some drills to work on your distance control. But basically, the reason why most people miss a four footer is they their putter face isn't pointing where it's supposed to be at impact. Right. right. It's not like they. I mean, a thirty foot putt. I, I I do this demonstration all the time with my students. Like, let's hit a thirty foot putt, and I, I'll hit a thirty foot putt. And I'll miss it five feet left, but I'll hit it thirty feet. I said I got a five footer there. Then I'll hit a putt that goes 10 feet past, but almost hits the hole. And I'm like, which putt's better? Obviously, distance control is more important on longer putts. On short putts, direction control is super important. So how many people have a setup routine where the ball is in the same position every time? Have you ever seen a regular, go your regular weekend golfer have a consistent pre-shot routine where the ball position never changes? No. Right. 
So now think about the putting stroke. Anything other than a perfectly straight back straight through stroke, which is almost non-existent on this planet, because it's the putter's on a, on an angle and it's got to be swung on and on an arc. Any change in ball position will affect the direction and the face at the moment of the strike. So if you go up there trying to hit a four footer and, you, and your your ball position changes from one hole to the other, it's going to go in a different direction. If it moves, if you move it more back, it's going to go as a right handed player to go more right. If you move it more forward, it's going to go more left. So I've been doing a lot of uh, work with a great putting coach out of Indianapolis named Bruce Rerick. If you haven't interviewed him, he should be on your list. Super nice guy. Used to work for Arnold Palmer. Probably, in my opinion, the best putting coach on the planet. And one of the things we do is we do a lot of team coaching. So I'll get them on FaceTime and we'll do lessons together. I'll have my students take a lesson. I'll, I'll bring in Bruce on FaceTime and we'll co-coach them. And it's been a lot of fun, um, both for my students because they're putting great and they have access to Bruce. And I get better as a putting coach myself because I have access to Bruce. And, and one of the things that we make sure with every student is they understand exactly where their ball position needs to be to roll the ball straight. And it's a real simple process that we do to make it happen. And it's not, it, it's not rocket science, but boy, is it important. And personally, I've never put it better just by having the same ball position every single time. So if I'm trying to make a four footer, I'm not worried about whether my putter face is going to come in square or not. It's going to come in square because that's where it squares up in that position, my stance, which for me happens to be just like, right the right side of my nose is where my ball position is and i can do it with my feet i can set my feet in a way where i know where my the right side of my nose is and and then the ball is in the same place every time and so i love four footer give me a four footer or or anything I, i'll you know put big money on it i'll make it if i miss it, it won't be because i made it because my ball position was wrong i'll tell you that i'll tell you i um talk about the, having the pressure of the putt uh, last week, I was playing with a kid, 14 years old, plays from the blues to a six handicap. Nice. And yeah, and after um, I had a blow up hole on 11, which put him in a five stroke lead on me. Going into 18, I had, uh, I had brought it down to, he had a one stroke lead on me. And I had an eight footer for birdie on a par five, not my specialty. And I made the putt and we both shot 79. Nice. I, it was like, that to me was like the most fun I'd had just because of that putt. I mean, it was a weird round. It was fun, but it was, and it was really interesting playing with this kid, just kind of like, Hey, you want to join our group? You know? And then the other two I was playing with, they finished after nine. So he and I had the back nine together. Great kid. I just think he's going to be, wonderful um but anyway I, I was just surprised that i made that putt and knowing the pressure that was on me and knowing that mm, it's not my specialty um yeah. but you talk about the 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 looking into the future that really comes back to also on the tee box the history where people are like oh i always hit this in the water oh i oh you know it's like it's like every time i play this hole this happens and it's like you just want to say Oh, then why do you keep hit, trying to hit the same shot? Why don't you just well, do something they, different? They also learn that perfectly, right? They're perfect learners. They have learned that when they show emotion after a bad shot, it stores it beautifully in the brain. And so they just have to decide what they want to store, right? So you should be like, you're telling me about that eight footer. You should be telling everybody, you know, about that eight footer. You should be writing it in your golf journal of all your great shots. You should be replaying it in your mind because then when next time you have an eight footer, that means something you're going to be confident because you made that one that you thought about right now, if you would have missed that eight footer and then you tell me on this podcast, Oh, you know, I keep missing those eight footers. It cost me an 80 instead of a 79. You're going to remember that because you learned it perfectly either way. It just depends on. Here's where the conscious mind plays a role. You decide what you want to store. Okay? Because the conscious mm -hmm. mind gets in so many things, but let's use it for what it's good at. You can decide after that made putt or that missed putt whether you want to store it or not. It's just whether you want to show emotion or not. You can let it go. Just kind of say the ball ended up short with no emotion whatsoever. 
or you can beat yourself up about it and store it in your brain. Okay. On the good putt, right? Remember that that uh, uh, Harvey Penick uh, comment? Go to go to uh, go to dinner with great putters in his in his little red book. Why do you think he said that? You know, this guy's obviously a, you know a a golf whisperer, right? Go to go to dinner with great putters because what do great putters talk about? They talk about the ones they made. Absolutely. They don't say poor me stories about the ones they missed. So go with you know. He's, and great putters just hang around them. It's contagious, right? So now you've just made that eight footer. Build on that. Store it. Talk about it. Write about it. Think about it. It's your choice. Yeah. It's your just mine gets to make those choices. Why do you think I told you the story? <laughs> I have no one else to talk to about it. I wanted right. to share it with somebody. <laughs> yeah, you're a personification, and it's not bragging. It's actually enjoying something that's also going to make you a better player because there's a skill of storing shots in your mind. There's there's a person who's got talent, and there's another person who's got talent and stores good shots. That person's going to equal talent. That person's going to win. I mean, was Tiger really that much better than to win 82 tournaments? Was he that much better than everybody else in the field, technically? Or was he just unbelievably strong mentally? Same with Nicholas, right? Yes, they were probably among the most talented, but each week there's going to be a couple other golfers who are just technically just brilliant that week. Why, why did he beat them so many times? It was the belief. It was, it was the ability to do it under pressure. If you look at Tiger's amateur career, the amount of putts he made under pressure in U.S. amateurs was absolutely mind-boggling when you think about the percentages versus the length of putts he made. It was unbelievable. And that putty made at Torrey Pines that they showed 50,000 times at the U.S. Open, you know, that, that whatever it was, a 12-footer or 15-footer, whatever it was, the fact that he made that one, you know, on a bumpy Poana Greens after all that play before him is, is, un, is unbelievable. It, it's, but the thing is, there's a belief there that gives him a chance, whereas others have missed it before they even hit the putt. Hmm. Let's take one more break, and because I have more putting questions, okay. we'll be back after this. For some reason, we continue to be amazed at the results we get when we incorporate the teaching of our mental game coaches, when all too often we focus on swing mechanics and hitting the golf ball. Yet, here on Golf Smarter, we've always placed a lot of emphasis on playing each shot as a unique experience, and as Dr. Parent frequently says, not getting in our own way. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans, episode 119, we meet Ed Bradley, who in 2009 had just published an ebook called The 18 Biggest Mental Errors in Golf and How to Correct Them. Unfortunately, the website and the ebook are no longer available, but that's why we have Golf Smarter Mulligans to refresh and relearn from helpful interviews from the Golf Smarter archives. Rather than putt to the hole on the practice green, put a tee in the ground and take the ball back maybe two, two and a half, three feet and practice putting to the tee on a fairly flat surface. And your ideal putt is one that hits the tee and bounces straight back to you. And by putting to the tee from just two or three feet, you are training your mind and your eye to putt to a very small, specific target. You'd be amazed when you then go back to putting to a normal golf hole. It feels like it's much bigger. You get onto the golf course and you've got this, what looks like a bucket that you're putting to now compared to that small tee. <laughs> right. Again, you know, if you miss the tee once out of the three times, well, it was a golf tee, it probably still would have dropped if it had been a big golf hole. So you're setting yourself up to win when you go out on the golf course because you've got a better mindset. That's Ed Bradley this week on episode 119 of Golf Smarter Mulligans being released this Friday. Both Golf Smarter and Golf Smarter Mulligans are available from where you're listening to this podcast right now. Please subscribe and follow both so that you can get a brand new episode of either as it downloads to your favorite listening device. Another video of yours that I watched recently was putting straight. And you talked about the lead elbow. Yes. And we 
kind of touched on that a little bit ago. Let's let's go into that a little bit because that was like, oh. And it's so great to watch you on video because, you know, the way you explain things and you're really phenomenal um, – teacher in the way your your ability to communicate and that's what makes the podcast so fun but watching your videos and bringing it to life is also really helpful and i highly advise everybody to check out the xander golf app and we'll talk more about that in a minute but the, the videos that he has on there is phenomenal um putting yeah. straight yeah so there, there are different fields that work for different the different players that one was a field that that definitely worked for me because I have a trail arm that wants to close the club face. And a good way of keeping that club face from closing is to let my lead elbow separate from my body and that, that keeps the face on lock. Um, since then, um, I think that's a good video for people who tend to close the face and that, that's great advice, but it's different for everybody, right? The most important thing as far as putting it straight is understanding how your trail hand should be on the club. And if you go, this is, this is Mike Adams information with his biomechanical testing. Some people, um, have a, have a, uh, a biomechanical predisposition to have their trail hand more on top of the club, some more on the side and some more under. So on top would be like a Matt Wolf, which is why his backswing looks so far outside. On the side would be like a Justin Rose, which is why his backswing looks like something out of a, a you know Golf Digest cover cover article. Um, it just looks so on plane and so so neutral. And then you have somebody like a Dustin Johnson who's got a more under his his trail hand is more under, um, which makes him a natural drawer of the golf ball. And then he has to do some other things to offset the draw. So if once you find your trail hand position, the face neutralizes quite a bit. The reason why you see so many claw golfers or claw grips out there is because they, they tend to have a naturally weaker trail hand grip. Um, and so the claw fits perfectly for that. Uh, for another person, that claw might be poison. But for Chris DeMarco, who came up with it a long time ago, it was absolutely, it matched him perfectly. And that's why he putted so well with it. And it sort of started a trend, right? You see more different grips on putters, um, you just see all kinds of different ones. And, and, it ha and it depends on what it takes for you to consistently and naturally return the putter back to square. So one of the things I do in every putting lesson, as, as I do with every full swing lesson, is I test their trail hand um, grip position. And once I know that, I, I have a huge head start on having them um, have a square putter face at impact. And then there's different feels that um, they can use during the stroke on how to move the putter. But um, if you don't have that trail hand right correct, you end up having to do some compensations in the, in the grip. So that video you're talking about was actually a video that, that I did that was a, a feel that worked for me because my putter face tends to close. And if you think about it, and every, your, your listeners can actually do this while we're talking about it. If you take your trail hand and kind of lift it up in a, in a fist position um, up by your shoulder and then you just throw a punch, you'll notice that your arm will rotate. So as the arm extends, the arm pronates or rotates. So what does that do to a putter face? So on the follow through of a stroke, as your arm is lengthening, the putter face is closing, right? Now... If you're a right aimer, that might be perfect. If you're a square aimer, that's going to be a pull. So you might want to offset it with the lead elbow, leaving the body a little bit. And that would keep the club face square. So it's just got to be the right combination. So as I said earlier, the, the question, the, the answer to every golf question is it depends. Well, what's your trail hand? What's, what's your putter face do? And this is where, where you're talking about having the apps that give you the information, the measuring devices give you the information. That's fantastic because now it's like, oh, it's pretty obvious that this is happening. I was actually using a, an app that told me that my putter face at impact was always two degrees closed relative to where it started. The blast mm -hmm. motion app was what I was using. And then once I started letting my left elbow separate from my body, it said your putter face is returning square. I missed everything to the right because I'm a right aimer. <laughs> so then I had to go get fitted for a putter to where the putter helped me aim straight. And then that whole combination worked beautifully. Mm. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of a journey. 
right? And and you, you sure. kind of that's part of the fun is both a teacher and a player is you get to figure it out, right? This works for me, right? Not necessarily for you, but it works for me. And if you're this kind, of, if you have this kind of tendency, well, that might be a, a thought that works for you. That's why friends giving friends advice is, you know, what keeps golf pros in business because they might be saying something with the greatest of intentions, you know, because hey, it worked for me. And I had a, I had a father daughter come take a lesson from me uh, day before yesterday, and I'm giving his daughter a lesson. He goes, I'm trying that. So I'm like, no, 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 no. That does not apply to you. That is for her. She needs to do why. And please don't communicate about that um, because it's not it's not the same for everybody. It's definitely not the same for everybody. If there's one thing that I want to communicate in this podcast or this this podcast is everybody's different. So everybody needs something a little different. And to, to make their to make their whole I call it a puzzle. To make this whole puzzle work. You know, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do my investigative report. You know, investigations of figuring out how you move, what your tendencies are, and now here, here's how your puzzle fits together, and now here's how Joe's puzzle fits together. And it's it's part of the fun of somebody asked me the other day, "Do you like regulars? Or do you like new people?" I'm like, "Well, I like my regulars because they become my friends, but I love new people because it's a new puzzle I get to solve." And mm. and that, that's a lot. It's a lot of fun. Um, and I tell people who are taking up the game because a lot of new new players recently with COVID, like enjoy the journey. This is a journey. You get to play this game for a long time. It's one of those sports where you get to play well into you know later in life, and you're gonna you're gonna go through ups and downs, and you're gonna figure things out. And you're gonna have light bulb moments. It's gonna be really cool, and you're gonna have some amazing rounds. You're gonna have some tough ones, and just enjoy the whole process and just. Just, just enjoy it. It's a, it's, it's such a cool game. It really is in so many levels. So many levels. What do you think about, um, or would you recommend? And of course, the way you just described it, it depends on the person. No. But um, uh, especially on the on the shorter ones, uh, a friend of mine, he'll he'll um, he'll place the putter behind the ball, putters on the ground, and then when he pulls back, the whole thing shakes. I mean, yeah. the putter head is like. It rotates back and forth and shakes and everything. Yeah. Um, and I and I suggested perhaps to give it a, a consideration of just hovering the putter above the ground just a half inch or so before you pull it back, mm -hmm. and it might be a smoother takeaway for you. What do you think about having the putter, you know, uh, on the ground versus hovering? How did it work for him? He didn't try it. <laughs> uh, I, you know, Nicholas used to hover his driver, and Norman learned from Nicholas, and those guys worked worked out for them. I think Ricky Fowler does, you know, and he's a heck of a putter. So I would say that's something you could try. I would. My first instinct is why is it wobbling? The first there are two things that come to my mind. First of all, is his trail hand in the right position for him? If not, it's awkward. And the second thing is, is the putter going back so slowly that it doesn't have the inertia to stay online, right? So some people Ooh. think back so slowly and their putter's like wavering all over the place. I'm like, if you gave that a little bit more energy going back, the putter would stay in its, in its line and its flow. So those well, are the get, things that yeah. bad, but No, that's, that's great because it, usually it happens with him on short putts where he's trying to finesse it. Yeah. You know, and it's not a regular stroke. He's going really slowly, so then it's shaking. Yeah. yeah. Actually, look on apps because there's you know, that same blast motion app tells you the tempo of your stroke. If you start seeing a really slow backswing, it should be two to one tempo pretty much. Um, yeah. See that mostly with great putters is a, is a, you know, takes twice as long to go back as it does to come into impact. Um, and if it's if it's like three or four to one or something really bizarre, then there's chances are he's he's trying to guide it back rather than just letting it go. Yeah, I remember having many conversations with uh, John Novosel of Tour Tempo, um, talking about the three to one right. on the swing, which I still to this day use, and it really helps my tempo a lot. Yeah. And you're saying put putter is a, a two to one? Two to one, yeah. Okay. All right. And yes, yeah, Steve Yellen has been on the show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so what, what's going on with the Xander golf app? Let's wrap up with that. Tell me well, what's going Xander on. Golf app, um, so I take pride in, in the videos that I have on there. My, my, and you should. 
my, my basic tagline is it's simple, logical instruction. I think people listen to it and they're like, okay, I have a very clear understanding of what's going on. And that's how I kind of approach everything. I try to keep them short and sweet. Um, there's close to a hundred videos on there right now. And I'm adding a new video every Monday. Um, and for your listeners, I have a coupon code if they want to join the Xander Golf app. They just have to type in uh, "smarter" all in capital letters, and they'll get a discount on uh, on the subscription. It's an annual subscription, and uh, yeah, so um, it, it, I feel like it's my way of being able to get my instruction far-reaching beyond the people who come and take a lesson. The app also allows you to do online lessons, so you can. You can book lessons with me that way as well. Send me your swing, I'll analyze it. Um, and I also uh, uh, even do like conversations where I have like a twenty minute conversation about what's going on. So a lot of people have, you know, want to hear you know answers to their questions, kind of like the questions you're asking me today. So just having conversations, I do that as well. And that's you can um, find all my information on my uh, website. But the app lets you see videos. There's a forum where you can communicate, ask me questions, which is great because it gives me ideas for future videos. So if you want to, if you want me to make videos on certain topics, I'm happy to do that. Um, and uh, it's it's a nice community, and it's a great way to uh, just get some simple, logical instruction. And you're very good at both of those, simple and logical. Thank you. Thank you. Great talking to you again, Josh. Thanks so much again for being part of the celebration and for educating us in ways that I just uh, find incredibly helpful every time we talk. Well, it's been, it's been a lot of fun as always. I look forward to our next one and stay curious. So hopefully you're telling your golf partners about Golf Smarter. And if you're not, then why not leave an honest review of our show from where you're listening right now? That way you can tell all the golfers you don't know what you think. It actually helps new listeners find us. Follow at Golf Smarter on social media and subscribe to Golf Smarter TV on YouTube to hear our podcasts and watch unique videos. Golf Smarter is your podcast for a caddy. And like your caddies, tips are accepted for services provided. Whether you give just once or do like Christopher did, when he set it up to provide a small monthly amount in our online tip jar. However you'd like, and as often as you'd like. It's greatly appreciated when you click on the donate button at golfsmarter.com.